mucus tissues. Okay, when we're talking about nervous tissues, we're pretty much talking about the brain, the spinal cord. I don't know why I'm capitalizing these things. They're not necessary. Uh, and the, what are called the peripheral nerves. In talking about this tissue, we've got two main categories of cells, two types of cells. First of these are the neurons. There's a picture. These are pretty much the type of cells we think of when we're thinking about nerves and nervous tissue. They're quite large. Uh, this dark red mass here in the center of the picture is in fact what's left of one neuron cell. The way they make these slides is typically what they're going to do is they're going to go to the slaughterhouse when they're butchering beeves or pigs or, or lambs or something, and they're going to take a little piece of the spinal cord, this is not human, and they're going to put that on a glass slide and they're going to smear it out as thin as they can possibly get it so light will be able to come through and you'll be able to see it on the microscope. So this isn't really organized tissue anymore. This is not really the way it would have been arranged in life. It's a mess because they have just smashed this thing and spread it out super thin. So this is what's left of the neuron. And we can see some of its features, some of its structures. First of all, you can see it's quite large. Uh, the nucleus is here. And the part of the cell that surrounds the nucleus, this large area of cytoplasm, this is what's called the cell body of the neuron. The cell body is the area of the cell that has the nucleus. Then you can see extending out from the nucleus, these thinner extensions of the cytoplasm where it narrows down and it kind of runs off into the distance. In life, some of these were probably much, much larger, much, much longer. These extensions of the cytoplasm are called axons and dendrites. Neurons are really what we think of as nerve cells. These guys are specialized to generate and propagate electrochemical signals that we generally refer to as nerve impulses. but later on we're going to learn to call action potentials. These are these, these waves of electrical and chemical activity that pass down through the cell to signal to other cells and to control other cells. The difference between axons and dendrites comes in which direction these impulses are moving. With dendrites, the impulses are going out away from the cell body. I'm sorry, that's wrong. Don't write that down. They're coming in toward the cell body. I told you I was tired. All right, so if the impulses are coming in 
down the dendrites toward the cell body, that, those extensions are called the dendrites. If the impulses are going out away from the cell body down the extensions of the cytoplasm, then they are called axons. Most neurons have one axon and they may have many more than one dendrite. But because this is a functional difference based on which direction the impulses are going, we can't really tell now by looking at these guys which ones are dendrites and which one might have been the axon. I'm thinking this one because it's the longest one still in the picture might have been the axon and then these little shorter guys would have been the dendrites, but I don't really know. I'm guessing. The other type of cell that we find in nervous tissue are called the neuroglial cells or neuroglial cells. There's actually several subtypes to this and they're going to, the names are going to change a little bit depending where on the body they are or what their, what their structure is. Uh, in this picture of nervous tissue, we, we kind of, sort of, can see where they used to be. All of this pale pink mass around the neuron is what's left of the cytoplasm of the neuroglia cells. And the dark staining little dots are the nuclei of the neuroglial cells. But you can see there's nothing here that looks organized or structured. It's just a big mushy mess. That's because of the way they made the slide. It does, however, tell us that, first of all, the neuroglial cells are all much smaller than the neurons. Right? These guys all, no matter what it is that they're actually doing, all of them are providing some sort of support services for the neurons. The neuroglia cells are kind of the support staff of the neurons. Some of them will transfer nutrients, they're gonna keep it well fed. Some of them are gonna insulate it and keep it electrically separate from other cells so we don't get any crossover of short circuiting. Some of them are phagocytic cells, they're gonna keep the nervous tissue clean and free of uh, pathogenic organisms. But all of them are providing some sort of service for the neurons. Their, all, their whole job is to make the neurons happy. So these are the two types of cells that we find in nervous tissue. And that's all I have to say at this moment about nervous tissue. We're going to be doing the nervous system later on and then we'll get back into this in a little bit more detail. All right. <sighs> That brings us to the largest of the four groups of human tissues, the connective tissues. The connective tissues are the most abundant form of tissue in the body. You have more connective tissue than you have anything else. And it is also the most diverse. We have lots and lots and lots of different kinds of connective tissue. And it can be kind of tricky to find any sort of commonality. What, what makes them all similar to each other? What brings them together in a group? They do have a few common features. For example, all of our connective tissues develop from an embryonic tissue called mesenchyme.
This is a very early tissue that forms in very early embryos. It's pretty primitive. It's almost completely undifferentiated. And all of our connective tissues are going to somehow differentiate from or develop from this early mesenchyme tissue. So in that sense, all of our connective tissues have the same embryonic ancestor. They all have the, uh, they all have the same root tissue. You, you were looking like you might want to say something. No. Okay. All right. Sorry. That's okay. I mean, it's one of the inconveniences of, of, of the fact that I'm facing everybody is I can see the expressions on their face. Nobody gets to roll their eyes or sigh without my seeing them do it. All right. Most of our connective tissues, there are one or two exceptions, but most of our connective tissues have relatively low numbers of cells. And relatively large amounts of extracellular material. That's different from any of the other tissues we've talked about. With epithelial tissue, we had lots of cells and very little extracellular space. With muscle tissues, we had lots of cells and very little extracellular space. What's wrong? I, I probably can. I, I haven't turned around to look. Oh, yes. Let's see which way are we going here. Better? All right. You know, we had used to have this absolutely perfectly aligned, right? This was exactly the right distance from the screen so that the whole field hit the screen. And then about two years ago, the genders came in during the summer and they took all the tables out so that they could mop and wax and buff the floors. And when they put the tables back in, you can actually see the marks on the floor up here. The, all of the tables are about four to six inches further back than they used to be. So now it doesn't fit the screen. And I keep thinking one of these summers they're going to come in, take all the tables out, wash, wax, and buff the floors, and then when they put the tables back, it'll be back forward again. But so far they haven't washed, waxed, or buffed the floors. Okay, so yes, thank you for letting me know that this was, was misaligned. I, I'm happy to fix it for you. So epithelial tissues, we had lots of cells, very little extracellular space. Muscle tissues, we had lots of cells and very little extracellular space. Even in our nervous tissues, like brain and spinal cord, lots of cells, very little extracellular space. The connective tissues, this gets turned on its head. Most of our connective tissues have low numbers of cells, spread out through a large amount of extracellular material. Also, this extracellular material usually contains fibers or fiber forming materials. Since these cells are spread out through a lot of stuff, it's not surprising really that they make additional structures to hold the tissue together. And in the case of that kind of connective tissues, most of these guys have got fibers or fiber forming substances in their extracellular material. Okay, and we've talked about this sort of thing before. Most of our connective tissues have what, are, what is considered to be moderate regenerative ability. The ability to make new cells, to repair damage, to heal injury, to replace what has been worn or killed or, or taken away. Most of our connective tissues would fall in the moderate or mediocre category for that. 
They'll do it, but they're not particularly speedy about it. The extracellular material of the connective tissues is called matrix. Now, the other tissues have extracellular fluid, interstitial fluid, but only that material in the connective tissues is referred to as matrix. Matrix goes with connective tissues. And the matrix has two components. The first part of this is something called ground substance. Now this is really the fluid part of the extracellular fluid. This is the, the, not liquid, but the fluid or semi-fluid part. So yes, it is usually a fluid. It can be a semi-fluid, meaning it's kind of thick and goopy. It's a solution. that contains some water, but usually a fair amount of salts and other electrolytes, dissolved proteins, and a substance called glycosaminoglycans. There's your $10 word for the night. Yikes. All one word. Now, it breaks down into understandable pieces if you've got a little bit of, of biochemistry or a little bit of Latin. All right, glyco would be referring to what? Sugars, right? Like glucose. So this molecule, whatever it is, contains sugars. Amino, make it ring a bell for anybody? The amino acids. Amino acids, which are part of proteins, right? So we have sugars, which are usually part of carbohydrates, and we have amino acids, which are usually part of proteins. And then we've got the glycans. Gly, glue, and we're back to sugars, mm -hmm. right? So this <laughs> molecule is kind of a weird marriage between substances that we usually find in carbohydrates and substances that we usually find in proteins. It has characteristics of both. It does, however, make the ground substance very thick and viscous. I'm never sure if I'm spelling that word right. Viscous and vicious are one of those combos where one letter wrong and you've changed the meaning. Viscous means it's thick and sticky and goopy. Vicious means it's mean. <laughs> and it's not mean, it's viscous. All right, so the more glycosaminoglycans, the more dissolved proteins you have in this stuff, the thicker the goopier, more gelatinous this stuff becomes. Right. So this is the fluid part of the matrix, but it's a fairly thick, gluey substance that's actually holding the cells together in the tissue. The other component of matrix, like I said, are the fibers. Really, almost all of our connective tissues have some quantity of non-cellular non fibers, right? These are made of non-soluble proteins. Even when they're in water, they're going to be solid structures.
again, there's a certain amount of diversity here. We've got some choices. The tissues have some choices about what kind of fibers they're going to make. Probably one of the most common types of fibers are the collagen fibers, which are made of the protein, the collagen. You guys have heard of collagen, right? That's the stuff they, they suck out of one part of your body and inject into your lips to give you those big puffy bee stung lips, all sexy and beautiful. Yeah, collagen. It's very common. Collagen fibers, when we see them through the microscope, tend to form kind of broad, flat, ribbon-like structures. So they're, they're thin, but they're, they're wide and they're fairly long. Collagen as a protein is pretty tough and is pretty strong. The more collagen fibers a tissue has, the tougher and stronger the whole tissue is. It is flexible, but it's not very stretchy. Collagen fibers will, will bend, but they won't stretch. So the more collagen fibers the tissue has, the less stretchy, the less elastic it is. A second type of fiber that we find in our connective tissues are the elastic fibers. These are made of a protein called elastin not a lot of creative thinking going into that one. Viewed through the microscope, elastic fibers tend to be very thin. They look th like threads running through the tissue. They're thinner, so they're not as tough, but they are very stretchy. hence the name elastic fibers. The more elastic fibers a tissue has, the more you can stretch it, bend it, flex it, twist it, and it will, like a rubber band, recoil back into its original shape. So these, this is gonna give the tissue a lot more elasticity, a lot more flexibility than collagen fibers. But they're not very strong so they're not going to do a lot to make the tissue tough or resistant to force. The third type of fibers are called the reticular fibers. These are actually kind of hard to see. Uh, they're very thin, and very delicate. They're also hard to stain. You need some very specific stains in order to show them in a microscopic slide. Otherwise, they, you just never see them. They're just not, they're there, but you don't see them. They're, they're way too um, invisible. Uh, they also form these kind of very branching structures. Right. And what we see with the reticular fibers is that the cells of the tissue are going to kind of fit themselves in between these fibers. So we think that the function of the reticular fibers, they're way too thin and they're way too delicate to provide any kind of structural support. But they do seem to act as a kind of an organizing structure. They kind of tell the cells where to be in the tissue. 
they're creating a kind of a, a, a template or, or a, like an outline like an outline or a, I was thinking stencils you know so that they're kind of saying this you know be here but not over here be here but not over there so they're kind of creating any sort of organizational structure the tissue has not by forcing the cells into a particular position or linking the cells together, but simply by creating a space into which the cells will fit. So they seem to be more organizational than anything else. So the ground substance plus the fibers all together is what we call the matrix. All right, now let's take, get into those connective tissues and really take a good look at them, all right? In the group or category of connective tissues, we have four subtypes. These are called the proper connective tissues cartilage bone and blood. We'll start with the proper connective tissues. So we have the four main categories of tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue, and connective tissue. Then the connective tissues are sorted out into four subgroups, the proper connective tissues, cartilage, bone, and blood. The proper connective tissues are then themselves sub subdivided into two categories. We have what are called the loose proper connective tissues and the dense proper connective tissues. And what do you think the difference is? The loose ones are looser, yeah. <laughs> the dense ones are, are more densely packed. All right, the loose proper connective tissues are areolar connective tissue, adipose tissue, and reticular connective tissue. The dense proper connective tissues are the dense regular the dense irregular and the elastic. We're not going to do all of these, but I do have a few pictures to show you. The word areolar is actually derived from the Greek for air. So the idea here is that this tissue is very open. It's very airy looking when we look at it through the microscope. So this is the illustration from the Saladin textbook. Just look 
and see what the other book looked like. Now, this, I, know, I know you got the other book. That's why I was looking at you. All right. So what we're looking at here, uh, there, isn't, there isn't a whole lot of um, structural features that kind of leap out at us. The cells of areolar connective tissue are a type of cell called fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are actually the most common type of cell in our body. And the picture they have here is actually one of the better pictures of fibroblasts I've ever seen. I have a picture from another book. It gives us a higher magnification. It kind of shows the, the usual problem we have with fibroblasts. All right. So in this picture, they were using a different stain. This dark circle here is the nucleus of a fibroblast. This is the nucleus of a fibroblast. This is the nucleus of a fibroblast. And we have one here and there's one kind of over here and there's one kind of up here in the corner. The usual problem with fibroblasts is the nucleus will stain but the cytoplasm won't. In most cell preparations, in most tissue preparations, you just don't see the cytoplasm. You know they're there because you can see the nucleus, but the rest of it disappears. So the fact that the people who made this slide actually got some of the cytoplasm to stain and into the picture, good on them. Uh, you can see these cells are kind of long and skinny, uh, but they don't have a very particular regular shape. They're just kind of round ovals. From the name fibroblast, what would you think these guys do? They make the fibers. Yeah, they're, they're making the collagen or the elastin or the reticular fibers. That's, that's a lot of their job. We also find in areolar connective tissues a few other types of cells, although not nearly as common as the fibroblasts. There are low numbers of what are called mast cells. Mast cells are actually kind of cool. Uh, these guys secrete uh, the substance we call histamine. Let's see if the other green one's any better. Histamine is one of the substances that's part of inflammation. It's part of the inflammatory response. Essentially what it does is it kind of opens up the blood vessels so more blood and more fluid will come through the area. Uh, this is usually being done in response to some sort of irritant. The tissue has become annoyed uh, by some foreign substance, dirt, dust, pollen, fungal spores, bacteria, viruses, smoke. The tissue becomes irritated and these mast cells in the connective tissue will release their histamine. More fluid comes through the area. You make more snot, you make more mucus, you make more tears, you make more whatever, and that's gonna flush out the irritant. So mast cells secrete histamine, which is part of this inflammatory response. They also secrete a substance called heparin. Probably have heard of this one. Nursing home people, what does heparin do? Thins your blood. No, it actually doesn't. It's an anticoagulant, thank you. Yeah. It doesn't actually reduce the viscosity of your blood. It's an anticoagulant. Eh, which I can't spell. Coagulant. There we go. It prevents the blood from clotting. 
why would we want to have that? Why is this a good idea to have cells scattered all around your body and your connective tissues that are making anticoagulant? That's absolutely true. And one of the funny things about blood clotting, I'm just starting to talk about this with my ANP2 class. One of the weird things about blood clotting is once something sets it off, once you've got a cut or a burn or a scrape or a little little boo-boo and it's bleeding, once you set off the clotting reaction, some of the blood will clot and that's going to stimulate more of the blood to clot, which will stimulate more of the blood to clot. So it becomes this big avalanche of reactions. And if you don't stop it, all of the blood in your body is going to clot and you're dead. Ooh. Yeah, that's, that's not good. So in the healthy tissues that haven't been damaged, these mast cells will secrete heparin, not huge amounts, but enough, so that the clotting reaction will only happen at the wound site, 